All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Server. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Yahoo Finance. The topic of this panel is, will the M&A boom last? And we have an awesome group of experts to hash that out. To my immediate left is Luisa Gomez Bravo, who is the Global Head Corporate and Investment Banking at BBVA in Spain. To her left is Mahinder Singh Banga, but he goes by Vindi. Please, correct Vindi? That's right. Who is a partner at Clayton Dublier and Rice in London. And to his left is Peter Orzag, who is the CEO of Financial Advisory, a Lazard USA, based in New York. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so lots to talk about in terms of the uh, environment for uh, transactions, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Before we do that, I just want to ask the panelists to briefly tell us what they do for a living to explain how their roles are salient to this topic. So great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. I am, as you said, Luisa Gomez Bravo. I'm head of uh, corporate investment banking at BBVA, a member of the management board, and uh, I run global markets, investment banking and finance, and transactional banking for our footprint, which is uh, a lot of it in emerging markets in uh, Latin America, in Turkey, and Spain as well. Vindi. Mm. Uh, Vindi Banga. My uh, executive career was with Unilever, where I worked in uh, every part of the world, uh, lived in 18 different homes, um, and was responsible for the global consumer businesses. For the last 12 years, I've been an operating partner with Clayton Duvillier and Rice, which is one of the first three private equity firms set up in the world in 1978. Um, I also chair the UK government investments uh, in, in London. Uh, and I'm on a couple of boards. I'm on the board of GSK PLC and uh, The Economist. Peter? And I'm Peter Orzag. I run the global advisory business at Lazard. So within that rubric, we have M&A, restructuring, uh, sovereign advisory, and capital markets advisory. Um, we are about half, in terms of our managing directors, about half in the US and half ex-US. Great, thank you. Um, and it's interesting that Vindi was talking about the uh, pedigree of Clayton and Dublier and Rice uh, being one of the first private equity firms. And I just sort of recognize that Lazard and BBVA are also uh, firms with a long history from the 19th century, I think, for both of your, yep. both of your yep. companies, financial institutions. So I think staying power is, is, is certainly important and kind of a, an important part of the conversation because you have to think long term in terms of these cycles. So Louisa, I'll ask you first, why don't I start with you? Um, Will it last? Um, it kind of seems obvious that it won't because, you know, when you have a boom, it's not going to last. But maybe the best way to get to that is to ask you where you see us in the cycle right now. Right. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I think, first of all, I think it's a little bit unfair um, when, when you are coming off such an extraordinary year as last year. So comparing anything against last year is always going to look... Uh, a little bit uh, worse. Um, last year, M&A volumes doubled the average uh, of the last 10 years. So even this first quarter, we still had uh, you know, an average volume of deals, which is 25% above that 10-year uh, average. It's still down, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's a little bit unfair. I think um, it's complicated because, obviously, uh, there are a lot of uh, headwinds that weren't there before. And we have obviously, uh, you know, the, the tightening uh, and the cost of funding issues. We have the growth issues, whether there's going to be growth or not is very relevant, obviously, when you're looking at, at, at M&A and uh, operational costs. So uh, these uh, financial conditions uh, underpin a huge uncertainty. And, you know, uh, doing deals in M&A, you know, you, you know, you require a certain set of certainties to, to develop the, the cash flows that are required. Um, so that's, uh, that's a little bit challenging. However, I would say that uh, near term, there are some uh, resilient areas. So not all is gloomy, let's say. Um, I think we will see a slowdown overall in M&A activity, certainly in our case, over the next quarter, specifically, I think, in the second half of the year and possibly going into next year as, as conditions, financial conditions uh, adapt and, and uh, the, uh, you know, the acquirers and, and sellers start understanding the dynamics. But as I said, near term, there are some resilient sectors. First of all, uh, I would say, especially everything that's related to infra is going to perform mm -hmm. well. Uh, we're seeing still strong appetite. Um, we have not seen any of the deals that we have in the pipeline uh, you know, uh, stop. 
And I think that's going to be uh, still there. Anything that's uh, asset, asset uh, investment is, is, I think, something that's going to be supported even in the next quarters. Right. And, um, and I think structurally as well, there are going to be positive trends. Uh, I would say on the supply side, believe it or not, there's still a lot of liquidity going around. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think corporates have come out of the pandemic in general. I mean, you have obviously sector by sector stronger. They still have a lot of cash. I think uh, you know, financial sponsors still have a lot of cash as well, and banks have liquidity. So I think that on the supply side, structurally, I think over the next you know, two to three years, that's still going to be supported for m and activity. And then on the demand side, I think there's also going to be uh, support from really transformational issues. You know, and I would just name three, digital, uh, ESG, and a third one which is new, uh, because these are the two I think that, that were not new. Um, which is everything that's related to the new world order. So obviously the relocation of supply chains mm. and what is now called the strategic autonomy of countries, that is also going to be shaping future M&A flows going forward. I love that last point. Peter, let me turn to you. Um, and by the way, we'll do some uh, Q&A from the audience uh, later in the session. Let me turn to you. I mean, having said that, Louisa seems pretty sanguine. Um, but isn't rising interest rates just going to kill the joy? Uh, not necessarily. First, rates are up, but they're still not dramatically high, you know, relative to 2016, 2017, 2018, which were years of pretty robust M&A activity. Um, so one doesn't necessarily lead to the other. The other big thing that has changed is the emergence of private credit, private debt, from very large private equity funds that are willing to put debt financing into deals they're not on. So it's a, it's a hedge against the uh, leveraged loan market and the high yield market uh, because there's now a new source of financing for transactions. But could I take this opportunity just to reinforce a couple? Mm -hmm. uh, sure. So we have, look, there is some pressure on transactions from higher financing costs just because, you know, uh, in two ways. One is uh, the cost of financing the deal but also in terms of the discount rate that's applied, which then you know, feeds into equity values and this divergence between, uh, no, my company's actually worth a lot more than the stock market is saying it's worth right yeah. now, which can lead to some, uh, you know, at least temporary divergence between the buyer and the seller in terms of what the underlying value is. That having been said, I, I still think there's a lot of momentum behind M&A. So I just wanna kind of pin that down a little bit. One is the pre-existing uh, effects of technology, which have been driving a lot of the transactions over the past several years. In one, one way of thinking about it is, arguably, the optimal size of a firm has gotten larger over time. It makes more sense to be bigger in today's world, given the benefits of technology, the ease, easier uh, ways in which you can manage a larger organization relative to uh, historical times. Um, and so, we, you know, that isn't stopping. Uh, the second, which was already uh, mentioned, is the energy transition, which is going to be a massive ongoing shock to uh, corporate structures for, the ne for decades to come and will involve both selling and buying of assets. So right. it's another uh, underlying driver. The third is COVID has really shaken up uh, business organization, period, in fundamental ways. So new business formation is dramatically higher in the United States, also in the UK and France, than it has been historically, mostly because coming out of COVID, people are rethinking how they can do things. Mm -hmm. And then the final point is all, was also mentioned, uh, I think we're likely to see, and I think that from a US policy perspective, um, hopefully we will see, the emergence of a US European super bloc um, that rearranges the kind of global order and has, sorry, significant implications for MA transactions also. Mm. And by that I mean much tighter integration between the United States and Europe, opening up a lot of room for European uh, investments into the US and US investments into Europe. Yeah, that's really picking up off of your point then, mm -hmm. Louisa. And that's an interesting point here too at Davos where it's sort of the the intersection of the public sector and the private sector. So that's that's what this would sort of engender or would be re, re, uh, 
well, we'll be responding to it in a way, I guess, essentially. It's an opportunity there, right? Yeah. yeah. Can I mention one sure. other really quick point? The other, the, yeah, that, yeah, sorry. sorry. The other ne negative, just to get it on the table, mm -hmm. is the regulatory environment. So let's just, you know, uh, right. put that on the table because uh, CFIUS, the various different national security uh, yeah. regimes, which then mm -hmm. kind of feeds back into this super block idea, um, and then also the antitrust um, environment. Yeah. I think what is likely to happen, at least in the United States, is um, many of these uh, deals that the Department of Justice and the FTC have been challenging are going to go to court, and the authorities may well lose a significant number of the cases that are going to wind up in court. And that can play out over the next couple of years. So even the regulatory environment may evolve, not only because the midterm elections in the US yeah. may shift things, but also because the courts say, I'm sorry, the law hasn't changed. You're interpreting the law right. in a different way. Right. And we're a little bit nervous about well, that. Well, that gets back to a, a regular Lena Khan in the United States and Tim Wu, who's in the administration as well. And they have a very different perspective than, that, than history, at least recent history. So, Vindy, sorry. Getting to you, your business, that's all you guys do are these kinds of deals. Does that have give you a different perspective on the marketplace right now. You also said you were going to decide after hearing from these guys, so that's why I decided to have that's, to last, that's right? absolutely fine. Well, okay. first of all, I would say I'm not going to uh, try and guess whether there's going to be more or less m and but what I would say is I think there's going to be a fair amount. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not ducking the question, uh, but there will be lots of it. Now, why do I say that? I think that, first of all, there is uncertainty right now, as everyone's pointed out, so things have slowed down a bit. But there's some pretty big changes that corporations need to factor into their business strategy, and they don't have time to respond. This week and earlier, there's been a lot of discussion on deglobalization, globalization, all of that. And that's going to impact the way in which people think about their portfolios, supply chains, et cetera. If I add to the data points that you've already heard, so I saw a study that said that 70% of 400 leading CEOs feel that they're going to do divestitures within the next 12 months. That's going to mean M&A. Um, there was pretty stable leadership for companies through COVID, not much change. Mm. Right now in the S&P 500, there's a CEO change every four days. Mm. And what happens when you get a new CEO? You evaluate the strategy, you evaluate the portfolio, that's going to lead to change in M&A. The last quarter has seen the highest amount of shareholder activism around the world. The number of campaigns launched has been the highest ever. That's going to lead to portfolio change. So I think with all of this, there's going to be a continued impetus for people to reshape their, their strategy, their portfolio, and hence m &A. Last but definitely not least, uh, public to private. There are lots of companies in every part of the world which are rethinking whether they want to be in the public markets or in the private markets, and that also could sometimes involve change of uh, portfolio. Yeah, those are some great points. Louisa, I want to actually ask you to maybe expand a little bit on that point about the change in the political order impacting the M&A business that Peter also touched on. And mm -hmm. maybe, you know, the one issue is the Europeans and the Americans getting along, right? Because um, I understand what you're saying, Peter, but there has been uh, some fracturing, on the other hand, over the past several years. So. Is it possible that you can do, will that inhibit or hinder uh, deals going back and forth across the Atlantic, I guess? Well, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Um, the thing is, the, the, um, a lot of European um, uh, companies were already looking at the states for investment. Um, you know, the, there's a concept of flight to quality, obviously, in uh, certain times, and that has been the case, uh, you know, since, since the pandemic. And, uh, and since also in some emerging markets, there's, uh, there's political risk that has been increasing, even before the war, right? So obviously now, post, uh, when the war, you know, post-war, um, there's this concept of uh, French shoring, right? So you're going to want to have uh, not only supply chains that are secure, uh, not, not just, um, you know, supply chains that you can, you know, geographically, um, you know, from a transportation point of view, ensure that are going to get there, but also um, that are placed in geographies that share the same values, right? 
And we've already seen, seen uh, an uptick of this, for example, when we're looking at deals in Mexico, right? Mm. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the, 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 the Chinese, uh, you know, um, situation also started, you know, a few years ago um, with Trump meant that a lot of that uh, capacity was already being replaced into, into Mexico. The, the signing of the agreement, the trade agreement, has also um, ensured that that's going to be um, a healthy, ongoing uh, interest. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing even um, Asian companies that had those supply chains in Asia into the U.S. setting up shop in Mexico to be able to retain the business, right? Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, there is a, a lot of that that's going to be going on. And I do believe that that concept of flight to quality on one hand and the French shoring on the other is going to be you know, structurally relevant for ongoing business. Right. Can I come in on yeah, this? Sure, I, look, I think this is one of the biggest tectonic, I mean, there are others, including the energy transition and technology, but this is a big new tectonic plate shift under the global economy and under uh, corporate activity. So just for a second, sure. it is, uh, and this is laid out in a foreign affairs piece that Bill McRaven and Teddy Benzel and I uh, wrote, but uh, there are more trade disputes between the United States and Europe than there are between the United States and China. Just think about that for a second. Um, so there is a lot that can be done to reinforce this uh, kind of rules-based block, if you will. Um, this is the moment in which it has to happen. If it doesn't happen over the next few months, it's probably not going to happen. And there are lots of things you can do, some of which is already happening. So the Transatlantic Trade Council, uh, Technology Council uh, is a good sign. Um, you could expand the safe harbor under CFIUS in the United States beyond just the UK and the other limited number of countries that get a safe harbor. There's no reason that shouldn't include France, Germany, Italy, other key allies. There's a lot that could be done to kind of really reinforce the underpinnings of US Europe or Europe US that would then give more confidence and uh, kind of accentuate the underlying trend because I agree there were a lot of European countries looking at the US anyway. It, you could you could kind of put some more uh, wind in that sail. And Vidi, jumping off of that, maybe um, part of fracturing around the world was Brexit, which is something we almost forget given everything that's going on uh, now. But has that impacted your business? So we thought it would impact the business a lot, but I think as we look forward, uh, we haven't yet felt that impact in a direct sense. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and maybe uh, it'll, it'll happen over time. What we are seeing right now, actually coming back to the main theme here, is we are seeing an enormous uptick in activity for private equity, mm -hmm. actually. And that's because um, uh, on the demand side, as we were all alluding to earlier, there's just so much traction. And private equity uh, plays such an important role in transition as a transitory capital. And this is, you know, when, when people are thinking about changing their portfolios, changing their strategies, even if it is actually changing their global balance between Europe and America, this is going to lead to the need for transition capital. And private equity brings all of that. The reason I'm smiling is because I realize I should make a disclosure at this point that my company is owned by private equity. <laughs> I mean, that is, so would say a lot of people in the world these days. A follow-up question, yeah. strategic buyers versus financial buyers. So you were the original, the OG of uh, private equity. So you sort of had the whole financial buyers lane to yourself. Now it's gotten very, very crowded. Um, has that pushed up prices just sort of uh, cyclically in a way that's um, unsustainable? So look, there's been a lot of uh, price upward movement in the last three or four years. And we've all seen that. The excess liquidity has actually changed the multiples at which transactions have happened. Now, from our own firm's perspective, we have always tried to shy away from the classic auction process, which drives these up, and actually look for opportunity, which is at a more, let's say, affordable price, which you've got to look for it. And there is still those opportunities do exist. And they typically exist, coming back to the theme of trans, uh, transition, mm -hmm. where the transition is complicated, where it's complex. Either it's a big complex carve out, or you are trying to put two businesses right. together, or you are trying to partner with somebody, actually. So wherever there is complexity, I think there tends to be an opportunity to actually be, be, be investing at the right price. 
And I, I think on that topic, if I, if I may jump in, sure. um, what we're seeing with our corporate clients is the, you know, and this has been increasing in the past, I would say, a couple of years, two, three years, uh, a need to couple and partner with, you know, with financial uh, sponsors. And this has been the case because when you look at the transformational capital that they require, just on digitization and the energy transition, it's huge. They can't, they don't have enough capital to do this alone by themselves. And they are uh, coming out of the pandemic very clearly uh, realize that they really need to, you know, to do uh, a lot of transformational deals. And um, a lot of this is obviously going to be organic growth, but there's going to be a lot of inorganic growth on the table. And for that, the partnerships, you know, between the corporate world and the, uh, the institutional money is very relevant, not even to say on the more heavy asset side, uh, when you look at uh, you know long-term uh, money, you know pension fund money, sovereign wealth fund money, uh, insurance money, that is really supportive of long-term dated assets that have uh, you know cash yields, low risk, stable uh, you know uh, predictable cash flows, and that they are willing to assume you know perhaps a little bit lower returns, but to ensure that they have that longer you know longer uh, yields available. So I think that that is also that partnership concept. I think is going to be yeah. really critical for the transformational events that are going to be uh, taking place. Could I just add to that? Sure. I think that uh, in addition to the uh, need for capital for corporates, I think the other thing that they find beneficial when they work with sponsors like ourselves or others is that they add to their operational bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Because along with this capital, very often comes operational capability. And these transitions are complicated. And they require a lot of change, change management and experience. And I think that comes along with the capital. I think the other thing, going back to the whole question of energy and ESG, yeah. I think that is going to be the source of a fair amount of disinvestment by corporates and disengagement. Right. And uh, again, you know, this is a place where I believe private equity can play a really important role, but for the right reasons. There is a lot that is talked about, about saying, hey, you can, you know, private equity comes in because you can actually hide these assets. Yeah. But I think that's not the point. The real point is that moving from black to green is going to be very long, complex, and a big transition. And that is where I think private equity can play a really important role in helping uh, the transition process. That'll be fascinating to see that unfold. Either that or Berkshire Hathaway. Right? <laughs> Take your pick. You can get Warren Buffett to buy your, your oil and gas company. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? We've got a couple of uh, this in person in the front row raise their hand first so they get to go first. Hi, um, I, I suppose this is mainly a question directed to Mr. Banger. Um, but looking at the UK market, we've perhaps had uh, a couple of years of, of particularly high activity sort of since the pandemic hit. Um, a lot of people attributed that to the fact that the UK was hit particularly hard by the pandemic and that there was, a, you know, sort of undervaluations. Do you think that's beginning to, to change at all yet? Um, I mean, obviously you say activity is going to be driven by... Um, uh, you know, sort of the transition process, but do you think that the valuations are starting to normalize? And also, are you starting to see any effects on, on your business from the UK, um, I guess the National Security and Investment Act, to give it its full name? So look, I, I think that, um, first of all, in terms of the capital markets in the UK, what you have seen is that the drop in the FTSE has been less than the other capital markets. Now, that may be because it was already perhaps a bit lower than the, mm -hmm. than the others. Uh, but that's certainly one point. Uh, I, I think the second thing is that in the UK, uh, I do still feel that there are a number of assets on the capital markets which don't really have what I would call their intrinsic value. And that's for a whole set of different reasons that one can spend a lot of time on. One of them certainly is the structure of the capital markets. And if I give you one example, just think of pension funds. Mm -hmm. So uh, the average pension fund size in the UK, and there are 5,700 of them, is 300 million pounds. One pension fund, Canadian pension fund, is probably 550 billion. <clears throat> so there's just a, a whole plethora of very small pension funds and so on underpinning uh, the, the UK stock markets. Now, that's not the only reason, but I think that's one of the reasons why 
a lot of the assets in the UK tend to be driven far more by dividend. They less focus on growth, they less value growth, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, there's still a, a, a pretty fair amount of uh, asset change that will happen in the UK capital markets. Fascinating. I didn't know that about pension funds in, in the UK. Another question? Yeah. Uh, so my question is uh, about value creation going forward. Um, and I first, I want to understand if you see any difference from the last 20, 30 years in terms of drivers and the value creation, and if so, how this would be done in an environment where you know, the regulatory environment, tax environment is changing, inflation is putting a lot of pressure on operating leverage, and the cost of capital is increasing, and hence the financial leverage is also being impacted. So where value would be created going forward if it is different from the past? Peter, do you want to take Well, one of, one of the reasons, or, or one of the uh, drivers there is the first factor that I mentioned, which is the role of technology. So if it's true, and this is, uh, you know, a debatable point, but if it's true that uh, the span of control is easier in, uh, today with technology than it was uh, 20 years ago, and there are increasing returns to scale in data assets and other dimensions of technology, um, there is a benefit to uh, value creation that just comes through those channels. So, I mean, we're clearly seeing uh, changes in the way that um, some of the benefits, uh, potential benefits and costs are described uh, in part because we've seen a movement towards uh, a stakeholder perspective and not just a shareholder perspective. But I, I would identify that factor as being uh, relatively more important today than it was 20 or 30 years ago, as you mentioned. Anyone have a point they want to well, add to that? Well, I, I think it's going to be created the old-fashioned way, which is through operational enhancement. I don't think that uh, you can rely on multiples and so on, as we've been discussing earlier. Quite the opposite, actually. The multiples are probably going to go the other way for a while. And therefore, value will be created the old-fashioned operational way. Um, to which is pick consistent. up the point on technology, it's really interesting. If you think about it, 10, 15 years ago, technology crept into companies starting in the supply chain. Now it's all pervasive. It's in every aspect of a company's operation. You can see the cost and productivity benefits, but you can see it actually adding to customer acquisition and growth. So I, I think that value creation will be created from operational enhancement, leveraging technology very much so. Really quick point on this, which is uh, another way of coming back to the, to the geopolitical and the sort of tectonic plate, I agree with all that is a lot of activity over the past 20 to 30 years went to where labor was cheapest. Going forward, it, as someone put it to me in a meeting this morning, I agree with this, it may well go to where energy is cheapest, and that is a fundamentally different geography. I think we have time for one more question. Do you have a point? No, I was just right. going to uh, mention very quickly, sorry, that, um, that I think that uh, it is also very important, the, the technology aspect also for talent retention. So I think this is a, also an issue that is very relevant. A lot of companies are thinking about how to retain talent and grow, because at the end of the day, you need that uh, talent base, and technology also drives that forward. Right. And, to, uh, and, and to your point, I think it's most, well, I won't say most, well, actually, yes, most of the value that has been derived from uh, the deals in the past couple of years has been multiple expansion. Right. And that's not going to be the case anymore. There's going to be you know, a flattening of valuations there, and you have to go the old, the old mm -hmm. way. Okay, that part of the boom's over, maybe. All right, last question here. Yeah, um, one of you said activism was the highest it's been in the last quarter. What do you think's driving that? Are there particular types mm. of activists? Are there the volume of activist funds rising? Is the about So I can noise? answer really quickly on that. Lazard puts out an activist uh, report. So it, uh, highest, high, a, lot, a lot of activity. Actually, uh, one pocket of kind of upswing there is in Europe, especially in France. Uh, for the beginning of this year. Another theme I would highlight is the blurring of the lines between kind of traditional activists, some of whom are trying to pretend they're not activists anymore, mm. and long only yeah. equity owners who are getting activist-like. And so the lines of what what is activism are kind of getting a little blurred. Anyone have another point about activists? That's good. It, it's coincidental or not with the rise of tribalism, one could argue, in the world as well, right? I mean, it's. 
Well, that's I mean, a whole most other of the issue. most of the owners are, you know, there's passive investors, right? And, and most of these guys are, are, you know, long forever, you know. Right. And the only way that they can, you know, increase the valuation of their other companies uh, that they own is by uh, being more active, you know. So. I, I think the so activism comes in when corporations are slow to move, generally. Yeah. You know, and, and that is it. Right. And. It, they're looking the for rate of change it's increases. The rate of change. They're, There's they're a lot not, of change outside. Stuck. Right. Yeah. And the question is, right. are corporations moving fast enough? That is often the source. All right. We're going to have to wrap things up with that. Um, I think we've come to the conclusion that, from these guys' perspective, the boom's not necessarily over. Although, well, okay, that's their that's their take on it. Um, and some interesting things in terms of how the M and A business is going to sort of leverage all the change that we're seeing around the world in terms of sustainability and energy, um, the new political winds that are, have shifted. Um, we didn't even really get into China. We just touched on that. Um, so uh, interesting in terms of a lot of different opportunities. And I think it's going to be a very vibrant and dynamic business going forward. So with that, please join me in thanking these panelists. Thank you. Thank you guys. Louisa, Cindy, and Peter, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you.